on then to um, Scott Tyler and uh, John Selker, the co-PIs of CTEMPS. And they are going to be uh, talking about um, DTS basics. Okay. Thank you, Chris. I'll start off. We'll just double check. Okay, you should be seeing, you should be seeing my full screen. Yes. yes. yes Very are. good. Okay, thanks. Good. Well, uh, first off, let me just say, um, it's been a pleasure since I've had my lunch to listen to the, the last talks. They were outstanding, just as the first group of talks uh, were uh, before lunch here in the, on the West Coast. So thank you very much. Exciting. It's really neat for me to see this, uh, I think, for, and for John and myself, I think both of us, to see kind of the spectrum of people and the spectrum of science that's, being, that's, that's using uh, DTS. I think it's just, it's just amazing. So we're really happy for this. So what we thought we'd do at this point, and I apologize, I'm gonna be looking at a different screen. So if I'm not staring at the camera, I'm looking at my other screen here. Um, we thought we would take a little step back and talk more about some of the DTS basics. For those of you who haven't used it as much, make sure everybody's on the same page on the kind of the, the simplified technology. And I'm gonna give you really, really the kind of the dumbed down version of how the DTS works. So everybody's on the same page. And then uh, John's gonna bring some uh, data in about, about things to do in the field and, and uh, considerations about resolution and things like that. And then we'll jump into calibration and we'll do that relatively quickly, but we'll share, I'll work with, uh, we'll have two presentations on calibration. Again, normally, if we were uh, all together in one place, we would be doing some hands-on calibration. We'd be playing with instruments. We wish we could do that. We will be doing that soon, we hope. But for now, we will do what we can. All right, so we've all seen what are the advantages of, of DTS. It's the fiber is, the sensor itself is quite, uh, in, it can be quite inexpensive. Once we install our sensor, we can make continuous measurements without disturbing anything. And and I think the main advantage is that we can get very high spatial resolution. We can measure across the landscape. We can measure up vertically into the atmosphere. We can measure down into, into water columns, but you've seen in the presentations how much high spatial resolution and also temporal, but high, how much spatial resolution we can get. And I think that's really neat. So again, let's just go back to what a typical optical fiber looks like. You've heard some of these terms before. Um, the center part of the optical fiber is typically called the core, or the, and it's, again, they're all made out of glass. So the core diameter ranges depending upon the, the type of uh, cable it is, the type of fiber, between either nine millimeters for single mode fiber, 50 millimeters or 62, and uh, sorry, nine microns, uh, 50 microns or 62.5 microns for multi-mode fiber. Okay. Then on top of that is something called the cladding glass, which goes over and that's, that has a different index of refraction and that's what keeps the light actually in the core. So the core is doing most of the light transmission. And that brings the, the diameter out to about 125 wow. microns, roughly the diameter of, of human hair. And then we put some plastic coating over the top of that. And then from there, we can add more things to make the fiber become a cable, something that will have some strength as a uh, as we heard earlier today, as Etienne talked about. So how does an optical fiber work? Just the, the really, really basics. This is now just a cross section through an optical fiber. So here's, uh, I've just sliced it right down the center line of the, of the glass. The core has a higher refractive index and the cladding has a lower refractive index. And if we shine light in at a reasonably uh, shallow angle, we will have total internal refraction of the light as it moves down the fiber. So when it hits this change in refractive index, basically it refracts it back into the core glass. And then when it hits over here, it bounces back. I'm just thinking of light as a particle, make it easy in this case, okay? So basically um, that's why we think of, of, fiber, of optical fibers as light pipes. They are transmitting almost all the light um, down to the end of the, down through the fiber. And that's why they're great advantages to send uh, signals. We don't lose much information, we don't lose we don't have to pump a lot of energy into this to get a signal way down to the end um, from here to, to Europe. But some of, some of what we're talking today is being transmitted on optical fibers. So there you go. So how does DTS work? Again, just a quick review. We send a very short burst of laser light and in the typical uh, 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 
uh, optics industry that would be called launching the light. We send it down the optical fiber. That short burst of light can be a variety of things. It can be a square wave as we, we saw earlier. The AP sensing is a, is a series of pulses. It can be ramped. It can be of different, slightly different frequencies. We can see a chirp signal, a lot of different varieties there, but think of it just as a shot down the, down the, the optical fiber. We send some photons down. Most of those photons are gone. They're going to the end of the fiber. That's the idea. That's how it works, okay? But there is a little bit of scattering that goes on and scattering is nothing more than, uh, I used to use the analogy of when you shine a flashlight in a dusty room and you see light, you see the particles, those are scattering events. The photons are being absorbed by the dust in this case, and then they are being readmitted. Uh, and there's three kinds of scattering. You've seen this before. We have Rayleigh scattering, which is elastic scattering, meaning the energy I put in, I get all the energy out. Raman and Brion scattering are inelastic, meaning I put energy in, the photon has energy when it enters, what gets re-emitted does not necessarily have to be at the same amount of energy. We can lose or actually we can add a little bit of energy. Okay, most of the scattering that we see, uh, that we see in our world, that when I shine a light on a, on a wall, um, is Rayleigh scattering, so an elastic scattering. So I get the same, uh, I get photons back at the same wavelength, uh, and it's therefore at the same frequency, it's the same color, okay? Um, so that's what most, and that's how distributed acoustic sensing works, uses a Rayleigh scattering, okay? Okay, so just there's a quick diagram of what scattering looks like. A photon comes in, it interacts with, with uh, the silicon dioxide molecule, the photon is absorbed, and then that photon can be readmitted. And in my simple-minded view, that photon can be readmitted and heading down the fiber going with the flow, if you will, nothing happens. I'm not going to see it, right? I'm not going to see a shiny uh, speck. I'm not going to see any dust in that case. Um, but some of those photons may get uh, 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 re-emitted back upstream. And as long as those photons are coming back at a reasonable angle, and again, thinking of a photon as a particle in my simple-minded view, um, they will be refracted at the core cladding interface and bounce their way back up, back toward where the light was emitted in the first place. So same thing as a flashlight in a dusty room, you're seeing this, the light coming back at you, okay? Um, if those photons are emitted at a very steep angle, they'll hit the, the, the contrast and refractive index and they're lost, they're gone. So I don't get all the photons back that are scattered. I'm only gonna get some of them back. The cool thing about photons and light is that it doesn't interact with itself. Okay, so I can be sending light down this optical fiber, and at the same time, I can have photons making their way back upward, okay, swimming back upstream. So Raman scattering, again, we've heard this, it's an inelastic interaction. It arises from different um, energy differences in the vibration and rotation energy levels of the crystal, of the, of the glass itself. Okay, it's a very small amount of light is backscattered in the Raman frequencies. Okay, so most comes back as as Rayleigh scattering, but immediately you can kind of think about if it's molecular vibration and rotation, uh, that's molecular vibration is related to temperature. The hotter the glass, the more vibration, if you will, the more energy the glass may have. So that gives us a sense of why Raman scattering might be useful to get temperature. Okay, And the cool thing is, the good news is Raman scattering gives us photons at two different wavelengths compared to what we pump it with or what we hit it with. And let's just show this, um, this figure that the two different kinds of, of uh, frequencies we can get. So with Rayleigh scattering, let's say I, I, I absorb a photon into this, uh, into this molecule, I bounce the molecule, molecular energy up, and then it spits the photon back out and it comes back down to the same energy state. It's great, okay? Nothing changed there. I didn't change, I didn't, uh, uh, no net change in energy. With Raman scattering, here I'm still at the same base energy level. I hit it with my photon, it absorbs up to this point, same energy as, as this photon. When it comes back down, okay, instead of coming back down to the base state, it comes back to a slightly energized state, slightly higher state. Essentially, in this case, that photon, that the yellow photon that went in, warmed the glass slightly, okay, because it absorbed some energy. On the anti-stoke side, okay, in this case now, um, there are some molecules that are a slightly higher energy level than 
you know, that we have a distribution of energy levels uh, in, in, a, in any glass material. I bounce that photon up high. And now when I come back down, I get all the energy back plus whatever extra was in that molecule. Okay, so now my, my anti-Stokes uh, photon comes back uh, with more energy. Okay, and typically we think of these as red shifted and blue shifted, and we'll just use this, um, you guys have seen this before, but just this wavelength versus amplitude uh, of what happens when light is refract is uh, scattered back. Here's our incident light. Most of the light is coming back as, so this is the incident wavelength. This is the wavelength of our laser. It comes back at the same wavelength, our Rayleigh scattering. Our Brion scatters, okay, they too are inelastic. So we do get some energy that, that comes off at slightly uh, longer and shorter wavelengths, sorry, shorter and longer wavelengths than uh, the incident light. And where these peaks lie for Brion scattering, which are a is a function of the strain that the, the material is under, um, these will shift their wavelength, they move around. The ones we're using for distributed temperature sensing are these Raman uh, 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 photons that are coming back. Again, I have some uh, photons that are coming back. They are red shifted. They are shifted to a longer wavelength. Those are, they're called our Stokes uh, uh, photons. And then some are coming back at slightly higher energy, shorter wavelength, higher frequency. Those are anti-Stokes photons. Okay, so just to give you a sense. And where these guys come back are Raman, uh, 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 photons are coming back at fixed frequency. So we know what frequency, given the glass and the wavelength that we're, we're shooting in, we know how far away these uh, Raman uh, photons, how far away in frequency space they will be. So we build detectors, or in the case of AP sensing, we have one detector that magically is able to see this wavelength and this wavelength. And again, that's something we know ahead of time. Okay, so that's good, so that's what's coming back to us. The whole time as these uh, as photons are traveling down the optical fiber, we're having some scattering, and that scattering then produce, re reduces the amount of light. It attenuates the light. We lose light as we go down the optical fiber because as we go down, we're seeing scattering. So you'll hear the term scattering, that's the physical thing that's going on. Attenuation is basically the dimming of the light as it goes down. Okay, because we're losing photons as we go. So typically that follows Beer's law, which is just an exponential. Okay, this is my I sub zero is the uh, intensity of the light at Z equals zero at the start. And then as I'm going down the optical fiber, the intensity decreases as, as I go further down the fiber. One thing in DTS lingo, typically distance is you, the variable for distance is usually Z. It's where most of us as hydrologists are used to thinking of X and Y, but typically in, in, uh, in optics, Z is the distance, okay? Just so we're all in the same, same wavelength, if you will. And how that light decays with distance is a function of A, distance, and B, the attenuation coefficient of the optical fiber. That is, how much scattering is there per unit length of optical fiber, okay? How dusty is the room? Okay, typically that's usually in, it's, in this case, it's in units of inverse meters, just if, if Z is in meters, but usually in our world, in the optics world, it will be decibels per kilometer as loss. Okay. okay, so just an example of what attenuation looks like. Distance down an optical fiber, okay? And so now as I go further down the fiber, I'm measuring how much light there is, you know, just with some, something, some way to measure light intensity. Very low attenuation, I don't see much change as I go down the fiber. Severe attenuation, I see a lot. And notice this is a very, this is an exponential de decay because Beer's law is exponential. This is also exponential. It's just, it's a very, it's uh, has a very uh, small exponential coefficient. So it looks linear, but it too, if we kept it going out long enough would be uh, exponential. Okay. So last thing we need to talk about, two more things is what we call differential attenuation. Okay. That this plot here says the slope of this line, the rate of decay is controlled by the, the attenuation coefficient of the optical fiber. Turns out that that attenuation is not just one number, it's a function of the wavelength, okay? It's a function of the wavelength of the, of the light coming back. 
Um, it is why if I look out my window, and John can explain this far better than I can, it's why the sky is blue. Okay? Red light is attenuated far, is scattered far more than blue light, or maybe blue wavelengths, or maybe it's the other way around, but John will correct me in a, mo in a moment. He's laughing. I can never remember that. All right. So the attenuation is a function of wavelength. Um, and again, we send down one wavelength of, op of light in our laser, but we're getting two wavelengths back on the way back. Stokes and anti-Stokes here are different wavelengths. Therefore, they will attenuate differently on the way back. Okay, so then we end up with a term called differential attenuation. It's the difference in attenuation between the Stokes and the anti-Stokes wavelengths. And attenuation, finally, is not necessarily constant or uniform in a fiber. It's designed to be, that's fiber is made with quite high quality. And so the attenuation, the quality of the glass is the same, okay? Uh, so the attenuation shouldn't change along the fiber, but all we have to do is bend a fiber, strain it, do some other things as we saw earlier, and we can change the attenuation of the fiber. And we can change the attenuation to the Stokes frequency, and we may not change it the same to the anti-Stokes frequency. Okay, so it makes life a little more complex. Okay, so here's uh, 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 just a map of intensity of our two uh, wavelengths coming back, our Stokes wavelength coming back, and our anti-Stokes as a function of distance. So I'm uh, from a thousand meters away. This is how many um, anti-Stokes photons I'm getting back in my detector. Okay, and you can see here it's, it's a little hard to see, but you can see the anti-Stokes seems to fall off a little faster than the Stokes because it's a higher wavelength. Uh, sorry, uh, a shorter wavelength, it will be attenuated more in the glass. And the green line is the calculated temperature using these two backscatter signals. And I'll show you how we got that in a second. The fiber is all at the same temperature. Okay, even though the intensity of the light coming back is the ratio between these two is different as we go down the fiber. Okay, sorry for the equation after lunch or or after dinner for some of you, but we have to do a little bit of, of mathematics here. Um, it turns out, if we can go through the math, that the intensity of the Stokes of the return signal, I sub S and I sub anti AS, anti Stokes, this is how much light's coming back, is a function of the temperature in the exponential down here. It's a function of distance down the optical fiber. The further down the optical fiber we are, the less light we're going to see back because there's attenuation. Okay. It's a function of the wavelength of the um, uh, anti-Stokes and Stokes frequencies. It's a function of some detector information and, and other things. Okay. So we have sort of three things. Uh, it's a function of Boltzmann's constant and a few other bits and pieces. The anti-Stokes looks identical to that, okay. except we have a different attenuation coefficient down here, alpha sub AS. All right. So what I measure is this and this. What I want to calculate is temperature. So if I take the ratio of those two things, lump things, do some simplifications, I come up with um, this equation above, which is the ratio of the intensity of the Stokes and anti-Stokes signal coming back. I invert that for temperature. Okay, So temperature is now a function of distance and the power of the two uh, signals coming back. And it's now looks like this. I have a coefficient up on top, which has Boltzmann's constant and Planck's constant, if I recall, in here. Um, it has some detector and wavelength information. It has our differential attenuation coefficient, and it has the power that we see. So from measuring the power, we can calculate the temperature if we know these coefficients. And in this case, one can think there are three coefficients that we might need to know. We would need to know the change in alpha, the differential attenuation. We would need to know this lumped term, call it a constant, if you will. And we would need to know the numerator. So from a simplistic standpoint, if I know the temperature in three places on the optical fiber, I have three, equa I have three equations and three unknowns. I can calculate each one of these uh, parameters and then get a temperature calculation. And that's what we'll talk about when we do calibration. There's many other ways to do it, but that's the simplest, simplest way to think of it. Okay, how am I doing on time, Kara or Chris? I want to leave some for John. You're, you're good, I think. Okay.
Okay. All right. So very briefly, here's what a, a, a signal would look like from your DTS. We've been looking at temperature signals so far, but this is the raw data that you would get from your DTS. This is what the intensity, the scattered intensity on the way back, this is what you're measuring as a function of distance down the optical fiber. Okay. Um, I have another slide, but let's not, we won't worry about that one right now. How do I know how far, how do I know that these photons here came from 100 meters away? Well, I know when the photon was launched from the, from the DTS. I know the speed of light in the optical fiber. And so when I see after in 100 meters, roughly uh, uh, 1,000 nanoseconds later, given the speed of light, I'm going to now see photons coming back from 100 meters. So we're just using the time of flight to get us distance. All right. So what we see is this is a cable that was actually uh, deployed underneath snow and uh, uh, before it started to snow. And then later in the season, as the snow started to melt, this was a cable that was partially under a big snowpack and partially out on the bare ground uh, and partially wrapped around trees and had skiers skiing over it. So it was a pretty messed up cable. But what you can see is, and let's skip what you see before, say, 60 meters. You can see the anti-stoke signal coming down. All of a sudden, it peaks up here at 100 meters, drops down, really goes up quite high, and then comes back down all the time, attenuating slowly as we go further down the fiber. These big peaks in blue in the anti-stokes is where the fiber was on bare ground. It was a warm, sunny day in the spring. Ground temperatures were up at 30, 35 degrees centigrade um, on the surface because it was dark, bare ground. And the stoke signal is, anti-stoke signal is quite high, showing that it's a hot spot. The, the stoke signal, uh, is also somewhat temperature dependent, but far less temperature dependent. And we didn't, haven't talked about why that is, but um, we can later if we need to. The Stokes signal is far, the Stokes returns are far less a function of temperature. They are a little bit, okay? But the anti-Stokes, again, we're always gonna be, to calculate a temperature, it's the ratio between the blue and the red at any one distance. Okay, so these are the hot spots. What's going on here? Okay, why are these big steps and dropping down? Well, I told you this was a fiber a cable that had been deployed and then eventually been strained quite a bit, um, wrapped as the snow loaded it, wrapped around trees. And each one of these drops like here is where the op optical fiber is bent around a tree, okay, or bent over a rock very sharply. And so we're having, instead of having all the light going through that bend and coming back, we're losing light at the bend because some of those photons are leaving the optical fiber such a steep curve that the internal refraction is no longer um, happening. And this is where we can also have differences in attenuation between Stokes and anti-Stokes signals as well. Okay, so this is not uncommon to see this. It's also, you will see these kind of jumps when you take two optical fibers and splice them back together. There'll always be a little bit of light loss that goes through. Okay, um, so again, where does it, how do we know where it came from? We count the time from when we launch a small, uh, that square wave signal to when we see the light coming back. And just as an example, we typically, uh, well, not typically anymore, but the early days of DTS, we would typically launch a, an optical pulse of about 10 nanoseconds. And in 10 nanoseconds, light will travel about two meters in an optical fiber. Okay. Is maybe about two more minutes and to give John Okay, thanks. We, uh, I will quit then after this. Perfect. Um, so in that 10 nanoseconds, it goes about two meters. So I send my 10 nanosecond pulse down the optical fiber. And as soon as I do that, I open a detector and watch for pulses. I watch for the, the, the dust motes in the, in the atmosphere shining back. And if I keep that detector open for 10 nanoseconds, I'm gonna see any scattering incidences that have occurred over two meters when the, uh, the, the light has traveled two meters, one meter. So that gets me all the way out one meter and all the way back. So I've collected all the returning photons in that first meter and bin them, put them away. So that's the first meter. I open the detector for another 10 nanoseconds. Now I'm getting light that has traveled four meters, two meters out, the next uh, one meter in the cable and that next meter coming back. And I keep doing that all the way until um, we've gotten to that first pulse of light has gotten to the end of the optical fiber. And then we repeat the process and we 
we basically stack our, our measured photons on top of each other to build up a better average of the amount of Stokes and anti-Stokes photons we have. Then we go back and calculate temperature. Okay, so again, just finalize what does it look like? We have a detector, a, a DTS, which has a laser. It sends a laser pulse down. We measure the backscattered light with one or with detectors and the two frequencies. And from that, we calculate temperature. Okay, um, I was just gonna give you an example. We don't need to. So that's the basics. All right, very simplified, but hopefully um, helps clarify for those of you who haven't seen this before, how this really works.